everyone and welcome to Scienceholic's February webinar. My name is Scarlett, I'm the Communications Director of Scienceholic and the host of today's webinar. We're very honoured to have invited Dr. Bertram Malay to be our host today. And let's move on to Dr. Malay's introduction. Welcome, Professor. Thank you for having me. Um, would you like to give yourself a brief introduction to, of yourself to our attendees first? Sure. So you, you see the sort of formal information of uh, books and publications and uh, professional roles. Uh, maybe I can say a few words about um, where I come from. I was born in Austria and I studied philosophy and psychology also some linguistics uh, at the University of Graz in Austria. And then I did my PhD at Stanford University uh, between 1990 and 95. And then had my first job in Oregon and uh, for the last 10, 11 years, I've been at Brown University. So you uh, can calculate that I've been around uh, for a couple of decades, uh, still enjoy it. So this is a nice opportunity to share some of uh, the excitement that has led me into this kind of scientific endeavor. And I'm happy to you know, follow your questions as your slides go through and uh, also would be glad to take any spontaneous questions that students are posting in the chat and we can do this at the end as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Vale. Um, just before we begin, I'd like to give a brief introduction of what Science Holic does. Uh, so we are a youth-run nonprofit that aims to introduce intricate scientific topics that, in a manner that is fun and comprehensive to teens. Our main priority is to serve as a free resource for students to learn more about science topics, and we strive for our teenage readers and contributors to be critical thinkers and promote thought-provoking conversations. We provide various opportunities for students around the world with English, English as their second language to expand their English ability. And we also provide volunteer and leadership opportunities to those who want to help others. Also to the attendees, if you have any questions for Dr. Male, please send them in a the chat. We'll try to go over them at the end of the webinar if they haven't already been answered. Also, we have some questions uh, that you guys submitted through the registration forms here. So we'll, we'll be sure to cover those as well. So let's begin. Our first general category is about your profession as a cognitive linguistic and psychological sciences professor. So Dr. Mali, what is the focus of your academic and research career? Here I have some ex excerpts that I got from uh, Brown University's, your website, your like pro academic profile at Brown University, but you can use these to elaborate. But, would you mind elaborating a little bit on like what is the focus of your sure. career? So I should probably clarify this a long title, Cognitive Linguistic and Psychological Sciences. Normally, the kind of work that people like I do would be housed in a department of psychology. And there are a few departments of cognitive science in the US. But our department is a, a amalgamation of uh, actually two departments that were originally a department of psychology and the department of cognitive and linguistic sciences. And to make it even more complex, the department of cognitive and linguistic sciences was originally the split off of cognitive science from psychology 15, 20 minutes earlier, merged with linguistics. And then we all came back to, together in a one happy family. And it was a bit of an experiment to see whether these different disciplines and methods would get along and all in all, I think it's been a good experiment. So for me, this was an attractive uh, position to enter because I switched from the University of Oregon to Brown just around the time when this uh, sort of interdisciplinary department was forming. And the work that I've been doing for a few decades really centers on how people make sense of each other. This is sometimes described as social cognition. And in particular, you might sometimes hear the term theory of mind. The idea is really that we carry around in us some sort of theory, an implicit theory, or something that looks a little bit like a scientific theory, but isn't really a full-blown theory. But we need concepts and ideas and assumptions and ways of, of reasoning to make sense of other people's complex behavior. 
humans act intentionally with plans and thoughts and ideas and feelings and they have desires and goals and they change their minds. So humans are complex beings and we have to make sense of them given that we live in these social uh, communities that we live in. And so social cognition has always been one of the major topics. Uh, and you see here some of the terms that I've uh, put down, intentionality to figure out whether somebody acted intentionally. Mental state inference really refers to whether I can figure out what's in your mind. So when I teach or when I'm on Zoom, I see faces, but I don't know what's in their minds. So I will probably try to gather from their faces and their maybe body what might be going on in their minds. If they slowly close their eyes, it means they're probably bored and fall asleep. And in interactions, uh, you have a dinner with somebody, you probably also want to figure out, was this just an embarrassing joke that you made or was it actually funny for them? So this is everyday life in a scientific question. And then moral psychology is really a step further. Not only do we make sense of each other, but we evaluate each other. In a social community, there are norms and uh, we have expectations for each other. We have to constrain our own behavior to benefit the community. And moral psychology is basically the study of how humans deal with that, how they have norms, represent norms, learn norms, how they enforce norms by blaming, criticizing each other, sometimes punishment, how institutions form that do this kind of work and how we make moral decisions, sometimes cheat, sometimes are altruistic. And the idea here is to, again, study scientifically what surrounds our everyday life and what we constantly face as something of a challenge in our lives. But as a scientist, I try to step back and study it. And then human-robot interaction is just sort of an addition that I hadn't really planned exactly to engage in. But it came to me because I met a few people who were working on these topics and we found joint interest in asking a pretty crazy question, to be honest, whether we could build a robot that has moral capacities, that could actually live in social communities and follow the norms, make uh, moral decisions, maybe even remind people of the right kinds of moral judgments, at least for that community. And so for about five, six years, I've been working on this question, how humans deal with robots, what expectations they have. Mostly robots are not yet uh, really that good. So we have a little time to study what humans' responses will be and how we might design robots to make them appropriate for what humans expect. Thank you very much. Uh, just now to move back a little bit, uh, what sparked your interest in the STEM fields and what inspired you to pursue a career in psychological sciences? Yeah, so there are really two uh, questions in packed in one. One is why in particular psychology and the related fields and why science? So the first answer is I was always sort of an introspective child. That means I observed my own thoughts and feelings and other people's thoughts and feelings. I started writing a diary when I was uh, a journal as some call it when I was 10 or 11 and this, you know, naive as it might have been at the time, it was engagement with psychological questions with my own mind and others' minds. And there was a, a particular author, Erich Fromm is his name, but the author itself uh, is not that important. But when I was about 15 or 16, I read books on sociological, psychological, philosophical questions of human life. And I just realized, wow, that's what I want to do. I want to write and think and, and do research on these topics. I've always been interested in them. And there are some people who have that as their profession. So that's what I want to be. So in high school and then in college and in graduate school, I basically pursued these questions. And this is now where the second part comes in. Even though I'd started with philosophy, maybe a little more so than psychology, I soon realized that even though philosophy inspires the kinds of questions that I had, to actually try to answer the questions requires a scientific method. We can speculate, we can argue and debate, and that's sometimes really important. We can question our concepts and how we define certain terms, and that's really important. And that's what philosophers do to some extent, uh, not the only extent. But then, I was frustrated to stop at that point. I wanted to actually collect data. I wanted to go out in the world and observe people and ask people and uh, 
in a sense, manipulate some conditions and see how they respond. And that's the scientific method. And I happen to be a psychologist and cognitive scientist using the scientific method. But fundamentally, what unites all the STEM fields is that we're not satisfied just to think about the world. We want to go out and test our thoughts. And the world has to speak back to us. And this is one way in which I think science is just very, very powerful. And we do this in everyday life, too. If I have an assumption that this computer mouse is here, well, then I'm going to test it by grabbing it. And if there's nothing there, we'll realize, oh, somebody fooled me. There's a projection onto the table. That's science. This is nothing but science in a very, very small nutshell. So those are the background uh, stories and the same motivations and the same commitment to science still you know, define what I do today. It's very interesting to hear. So you were very, so you knew you wanted to work in this field since you're very young, right? <laughs> Yeah, and you know, almost the first thought was, wow, there are some people who make money with thinking writing. They are called professors. I guess I want to become a professor. And from then on, I just try to figure out what, what does it take to be a professor? What do they really do? Mm -hmm. Is that just an illusion that uh, they write books all day long and then get paid for that? Or what's the reality of an academic position? And so step by step, I learned what that means and what it would take to get into it. And I think the path is a very long one. So it's not that when I was 15 or 16, I simply decided about my future. I realized what I was interested in, but then, you know, it could have gone in different directions. I was lucky many times. And then when you get lucky, the question is, do you do something with it? Do you take that luck and uh, produce the next step? And if you are not lucky and you have a challenge, then you test yourself. Do you have the commitment and the interest and the passion to still go on and see whether there's another path that you can get onto a, or maybe a little detour onto the goal that you have? Mm, that's very inspiring. Thank you. Um, to ask a little bit more about Brown, how is research conducted at Brown University? Uh, how do students contribute to your projects? And could you elaborate on how Brown's emphasis on the multidisciplinary approach to learning has influenced your research and pro projects as seen from the open curriculum that Brown is very famous for. Right. So maybe I'll tell you a little bit how students are involved uh, in my research first, and then I'll talk a little more about Brown generally. So as a psychological scientist, more so than ever during the pandemic, I conduct online studies as well as in-person real lab studies. And what that means is that in each case, we try to pose certain questions to people. We give them pictures or audio recordings or videos or stories, and we devise those what we call stimuli in ways that in elicit a certain response and then we measure the response and then we have certain theoretical expectations about what the response might be on the one or the condition and we analyze the data and write them up. So that process is done by undergraduate students, graduate students, postdocs, professors, just at different levels of training. Undergraduate students might start in my lab, which means they come to uh, the group meetings that we have they learn about other people's projects. They begin to contribute to some projects. They may do anything from uh, helping pretest some stimuli. They give us first feedback, what it might be like to get this experiment. They help us improve it. Then they might help us collect the data or analyze the data, do some text analysis on some of our responses. And eventually they might do a project on their own, an honors thesis, for example typically in their fourth year of college, they work with me on defining a particular topic and then uh, designing, planning, and conducting one or two studies in the course of typically six or so months. And then they write up this thesis, this honors thesis, as their first sort of scientific paper. And then there are, of course, the next steps for graduate students who I found their passion, just like I have found it, and they then work on their own projects, but also work with undergraduate students. Sometimes the students assist them, sometimes they collaborate. So that's kind of at the student level how 
in my lab and probably also other people's labs, uh, students contribute in really multiple ways. They probably learn more early on and then they also mentor others later on. And for the most part, we work really as a team and whoever comes, you know, or has just more recently come, listens a little more, contributes more, and then over time, they feel more comfortable to criticizing, to also maybe contributing some new ideas, proposals. That's sort of the apprenticeship model that we follow. And Brown in general, it's, it's a relatively small school as far as you know, research university size goes. We have about 8,000 students, whereas for example, Harvard and Yale have like more than 20,000 and uh, there are other schools that have 40 or 50,000 like Texas or Ohio. So it's a relatively small school and it tries to give students, college students, uh, the feeling of more a liberal arts college. The real liberal arts colleges are usually even smaller, two to four to 5,000 students. But there is this sense that you can even in a somewhat larger university, create or recreate this feeling of smaller classes, greater freedom, exposure to many different perspectives and opportunities. And that's what Brown has really tried to do for now you know, 60 years. And the open curriculum is really just one part of that. It encourages students to look outside their immediate interests, which you know, even though I found early on what I would like to do, Notice I also had philosophy and psychology and linguistics, and I am still interested in architecture and music and other things. And Brown, in a sense, supports that kind of broader approach, even though you might specialize in one domain. You are encouraged to really keep your interests open and expose yourself to challenges in ways that you might not if everything is singularly concentrated on one topic, on one major, on one particular discipline. And so this environment inspires me and because my work is also typically cutting across some disciplinary and methodological boundaries, students who take my classes also typically feel that's the kind of work that they hoped would be done at Brown and those are the kind of topics and the kinds of uh, ways of thinking that uh, they enjoy. So this is then the interchange that happens between the, the teacher and the student. That's very interesting. So students get to have more experiences, even though they they might declare major in only a smaller discipline. Absolutely, and there is uh, there, are, there are a whole set of additional features, and I'll just describe one in order to encourage students to take other classes that are outside of their maybe primary interest, that might even be a little challenging because they have not taken a class of this sort or they might have had some bad experience in high school with that particular discipline, but they're still curious. What they can do is they can take the course. First of all, they have longer time to try out courses during the first two weeks of the term. Second of all, they can decide whether they take the course uh, for a grade or they take it only for you know, pass, no pass. And they have the opportunity towards the end of the term if they really didn't do well and they don't want to risk uh, you know, failing a course, they can stop taking the course. Now you can't do this for a lot of courses. <laughs> you don't want to do this you know, once every semester, but you have that last option. You know, it's that, that second parachute. You really tried hard. It just didn't work out. And knowing that, students are more willing to take some risks. They're more willing to try things out because they know it's not gonna damage their entire career. So Brown tries to set it up that you are encouraged to explore while you have to declare a concentration in your second year, but that's not the only thing you're supposed to do. That's just one focus while staying broad and open. That's sort of the, the, the ethos that uh, students uh, are expected to adopt. I see why Brown is so highly regarded for its open curriculum. Uh, moving back to your career, what is one specific experience throughout your research or teaching career that you find particularly re rewarding or memorable? Is there a specific memory that comes to mind immediately? And what's your like, favorite part of working in STEM to piggyback? Yeah, so 
I could probably answer the second question first and then I go to, I'll go to one or two examples. What really is the most exciting thing is discovery. That is, you have some expectation, maybe you have a hypothesis, but you don't yet know whether you're right. You then somehow challenge reality. You try to find out, you observe, you test, you experiment, you repeat the experiment. And at some point you discover a novel fact or you discover that you were wrong or you discover that you were right. All those things are really among the most exciting things that you can have as a scientist. It's not that you always have to be right. Sometimes being wrong can be very insightful. You just have to be careful not to invest so much in your idea that you think you are stupid if you're wrong. You're not gonna be stupid if you're wrong. You're stupid if you don't listen to reality and you hold on to your hypothesis, even though reality tells you that you're wrong. So you need to listen to reality and then you will be rewarded by discovery. And there are a couple of examples of discovery that really just uh, they still are in my memory. The first one was during graduate school and I was in my third year. And I started to develop a theory of how people explain behavior. So when you ask me, so wh why does your wife uh, stand in the doorway? Let's assume she, she just stepped in there. I'm going to explain her behavior to you. I'm gonna use language, I'm gonna use certain concepts, I'm gonna make certain assumptions about what you know, what you don't know, what you expect even the answer might be. So I was studying what it is that people do when they explain behavior to others or to themselves. And in the course of doing that, I developed a model that was inspired by philosophy that was uh, actually relatively critical of what at the time social psychology did. And I started to just extract text that people wrote in diaries, in, in papers, in newspapers. When people answered why questions, when they gave explanations, what language did they use and what did the language reveal to us? And I had this particular hypothesis about one particular method in which people answer why questions. And I'm not gonna go into detail because it would take so long, but I had this conceptual idea and then I found it in the very words that people used, in the repeated and consistent patterns that different people would use for different behaviors, but they revealed to me that that hypothesis was right. And that was just an extremely exciting moment to see it in front of me and to know I didn't create these data, people gave them to me. And I had a certain hypothesis and the test in a sense was right there in front of me. And the second one was uh, several years later, in fact, about 10 years later, when I used what's called meta-analysis, which is a method where you look at a lot of experiments that have already been published and you analyze the results of the experiments. So rather than having one experiment where you analyze the data of many people in psychology or uh, many reactions in, in the chemistry lab, I looked at many published studies and tried to find the pattern that they revealed. And there were two hypotheses, one that was in the literature and the other one that I had started to develop over time. And dozens and dozens of papers, experiments published in the literature started to come together as basically a distribution of results. And so if you, you can imagine you first have just a few dots and then there are more dots and then the dots concentrate in one particular area and there are a few outside, but they concentrate more and more. And then you have a distribution that revealed to you what the predominant consistent results are over the number of like 100 papers, 100 published articles. And that moment to sort of see how that distribution emerged where then every new paper fit into the distribution and didn't really change the overall pattern. That was just really exciting where you have a sort of a graphical representation in front of you of decades of work that other people did and by that time, almost a year of work that I had put into this uh, project, and there it was in front of me. And that was the most powerful way of then also communicating to others what I had found. It really must have been so amazing to know the hard work pays off. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, moving on to more general questions on career pops and advice, for example, what does your typical workday look like? Perhaps it might be affected by you know, COVID-19, COVID but usually what does 
what do you do in the usual weekday? Yeah, so COVID-19 actually hasn't affected my daily schedule as much. The main difference is that I don't go physically to work right now, but typically what uh, for about 10, 15 years, what it looks like is I get up in the morning. Nowadays, I don't have breakfast anymore. You know, 20 years ago, I had breakfast. Nowadays, I just make myself a nice cappuccino. That starts my day. And then uh, normally I work for like three, four hours. And when I do have meetings, either on Zoom or in person, then I'll start the meetings at 12 or one o'clock. I have some student meetings, maybe some uh, administrative meetings. And then I already look forward to my four o'clock coffee, my cappuccino then. And then I might have another meeting or two. And then uh, dinner with my wife, we might watch some a movie. And I'm a night owl. So that means I actually work pretty late. So I have a few more hours late into the night. Uh, and I might do some writing. I might do some statistical data analysis. And then I go to bed late. And then I get up maybe earlier than I should. Maybe my wife always tells me that I don't get enough sleep. But then the, the day starts over. So what I do is typically sort of in packages. In the morning, I always try to really carve out time for myself. I try not to schedule meetings. And when I teach in any given semester, I usually either teach in the mid-afternoon or sometimes in the late morning into lunchtime. So that way I still have a, a pocket of time before and in between so I don't feel uh, either unprepared or that I have to teach right after getting out of bed or something. So I try to distribute the exposure to other people, to students, to colleagues, uh, when I have meetings, uh, to the times when I you know, feel ready and when I have done already a little bit of work. There's always this sort of give and take. As an academic, you have to carve out time for yourself, for writing, thinking, obviously also email, the annoying uh, uh, reality of modern life now. But then there are other times when you devote yourself to others in meetings, teaching, and then you want to come back again to your uh, time. So that is the back and forth that I think every academic has. And you can either see this as a struggle or you can see it just as a dance. You work with others, you go back to your own sort of place. You then work with others and come back. So that's how I, I typically uh, live my days. Whether COVID or not, that just sort of adjusts a few parameters. All right, thank you for sharing. Um, we, uh, talking more about your, what you think, what kind of students would be a good fit for sci studying psychology or psychological sciences or just linguistic sciences, the fields that you're uh, in, in, uh, studying? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to uh, answer them separately because psychology and linguistics, at least as they are traditionally defined, are rather different, although in my mind they do come together nicely. So to become a psychological scientist, obviously you have to have fascination and interest with human behavior and human thinking. Now, most people have that, but that alone is therefore not enough. You just have to have that passion first. And you also need to have some observational skills. That is sometimes you need to be able to step back, you know, watch some people in a coffee house or watch your friends uh, get into an argument with each other and think about the patterns, the regularities, maybe the disconnect, maybe the escalation processes that you'll see. You might also observe by just reading novels, watching movies. The sharpening of your observational skills is probably the most important part because you have to be able to step outside of just living human behavior and human thinking. As a participant, you have to sometimes be just an observer. Now, you don't have to deny that you are a participant, but you have to sometimes take that step back. And for some people, that's actually difficult. So fascination and passion are great, but those observational skills and the ability to step back and finding patterns, that's what makes it a scientific endeavor. I think even the first two parts are important. You don't have to become a psychological scientist. If you become more aware of humans and how they act and become more aware of your own emotions, thoughts, flaws, then that's already great because you probably are a better uh, human being in some sense, you're a better community member. To become a scientist, that last step of observation and stepping back is important. And linguistics is more 
where the focus is not so much human behavior in general, but rather language, language behavior, and the particular way languages work. So it's not so much that there's lots of diversity, people speak different languages and they have different dialects and they use different kinds of language in different contexts, that's very important. But you also need to have the other side of what are the commonalities? What brings most or all human languages together that they have some features, some properties, some rules that seem to really be there in every single way of human communication as far as we know. So you look at generality, you look at variation, and you try to find the overall picture. In addition, I think that you have to be ready to ask some pretty deep questions about meaning, what it even means that a word stands for a concept, that a word stands for a piece of reality. Those are more philosophical questions about language. And then I also think that a third dimension is important that you think about language as one tool of communicating. Now we use spoken or written language. We also use nonverbal language. We use uh, body language. We use artifacts. You know, if I place a particular device in front of you, I communicate something to you. And humans are extremely good at picking up all these communication signals where language is one particular way, sort of classically language is one way, but there are other communication tools. So to me, a student who can, in a sense, combine these interests and the sensibility for language, but also communication in general, would be a terrific fit for linguistics. Thank you for sharing. I'm sure that will be very helpful for many of our attendees. Um, so to, pick, to piggyback off of the previous question, what advice would you give to high school students who are considering a career in the STEM fields? I'm not sure why that says chemistry and engineering. I'm very sorry for that. But most specific, specifically, you know, psychological sciences and those you're, you oh, teach. Absolutely. I think the first step is always find that fascination, that passion, or at least the interest. It doesn't have to be immediately, I'm so passionate about psychology or about chemistry or whatever, but there's something interesting about it. And then take opportunities to read, to see a documentary, to take a course, to talk to somebody who's in this field, to talk to a teacher who knows something about it. And in a sense, test yourself. Now that you know a little more, do you want to know even more? And this keeps going. Each time you know a little more, do you now feel actually if anything, I now realize that I know less. So there's this way in which as you push further into a particular field as a high school student and then as a college student, you know more, but you also realize that you know so many things imperfectly or not at all. And you have to be ready for that, which means you're not going to feel like you're going to constantly get smarter, but rather some, for some time, you will actually feel you get dumber because as you push ahead and challenge yourself to learn new things, you'll realize, wow, this is really hard. So you're interested in physics. And at some point you start reading quantum physics or relativity theory and your head starts hurting. Well, well, that's a good sign, right? Because you already went to a step that is really challenging. So now the question is, do you challenge yourself further? There's so much out there. Even now, you know, 30 years after uh, I started learning about all kinds of things in my science, you can see on YouTube and on web pages and in, in free documents so much knowledge out there. I really think that uh, Wikipedia and other resources are just amazing. That they're just there. You can test within a few hours whether you're interested in something. So as a high school student the best thing you can do is explore and push yourself and not just in one direction, maybe two or three, sort of the brown spirit again, right? Test yourself. And if it's not really that interesting, or if you feel like I can't wrap my head around these things, well, then there are other things to do. But I think that there's so much knowledge out there that you can't just wait for it to be presented to you, for that teacher to come along who inspires you. You can be your own inspiration. Or you can be your inspiration for your friend. Together, you explore something. You look at a documentary. You take a course together online. You talk about it. 
So you want to find the questions that interest you, but you also want to find out what questions interest you by exploring. And that idea about exploration, I think, is the most important part. I think in high school, maybe even more so than later on, because later on, you'll probably have already made some decisions, some narrowing. In high school, at least in the US, I, I, I think in other countries, it's a little different. You still have a lot of freedom and take that freedom, take that opportunity to go into many different directions. Thank you for that. That's very reassuring. Uh, I actually would like to take the time right now to address some of the attendee questions because I think they uh, come along very nicely with these. So um, you see, someone asks, uh, do you have any other interests aside from philosophy? philosophy, psychology, and linguistics, and how do you find, another attendee asks, how do you find a balance and the time between all of your interests? And you were also, another attendee asks, you, you can able to successfully combine varying areas of your studies, and how would you have your advice for students who have multiple interests and pursue careers based on these, perhaps, uh, not areas that don't really go together too cohesively. Right. Yeah, so these, these nicely fit together. Thank you for, for pulling them out. Um, yeah, I certainly have many interests. Uh, as, as, a, as an academic, you do have to push a few things to the side, at least for a while. I've always tried to keep them alive in different ways. So when I was a teenager, I played classical guitar. I don't do this anymore. I just don't have the time to actually, you know, practice and, and you know, stay up uh, at my skill level. But I listen to music quite a bit. I listen to some pretty wacky music, uh, 21st century classical, avant-garde jazz, uh, Radiohead, all kinds of things. And I sort of tailor my music to the work I do. So I often play music at my computer. I have some pretty good loudspeakers here. And so I expose myself to music, even though I don't have time to listen to music for two hours or to play music for two hours. I also love architecture and design and art. And I try to integrate that when I travel. Uh, I go to a conference. I always try to carve out at least half a day just walking around a city, see what it's like, how people build and live. I particularly love Japan, I have to say, because the, the design sensibilities of Japan are just very fitting with my own sort of tastes and flavors. So I, I just, try to take opportunities to keep alive these additional interests. And how do I find a balance? Well, that's the beauty about being an academic. If I just want to do a little bit of drawing in the morning because uh, we are thinking about maybe building a house sometime in the next few years, I can do that. And that means I have to finish this uh, journal review late at night or late at night, I just want to listen to some music or I want to finish watching this movie that really fascinated me. Okay, that I just have to get up a little earlier and finish that journal review in the morning. So that flexibility that I'm my own boss, now I have to get the stuff done. I can't just, you know, draw and watch music, uh, watch movies all the day, all day long, but I have the flexibility to sort of shift and rebalance. And that doesn't always work as well if you're under pressure to you know, deal with some deadlines, then you possibly have to push more things away than you'd like. But you can reintroduce them, you can bring them back. And I think the most important part is that you, you need to also get out of your own mind. And you know, that's one of the hardest parts about the pandemic, right? That uh, especially people who live alone really have not had this opportunity to reconnect with others, just have a meal together. Or uh, we sometimes have had, you know, Zoom drinks with friends or, or a Zoom dinner with friends who live far away and we knew we wouldn't see them anytime soon. So there's a way in which exposing yourself to people again, not doing any work, not doing any hobby on your own, but being back with others, that also rebalances you. And I think that sometimes just Talking and eating together, having a meal together are some of the most important things to kind of find your harmony inside. And then you'll go back to work or you go back to your hobby, but uh, you have regrounded yourself because we are such fundamentally social beings that that really is like uh, good medicine for us. 
Uh, thank you for that. But would you uh, elaborate a little bit on like another question, which is, um, do you have any advice for students with multiple interests and how they can ensure those right. areas can work together cohesively and pursue these different areas simultaneously? Yeah, so that is easier early on and becomes harder later on, and then becomes easier again towards the end of your career. So it's easy right now for high school students, college students, at least in some colleges, to just really try out a lot of things and take more classes than just for your major. We talked about this before. Then you probably start to narrow down a little bit. You don't have to forget about those other interests. You sometimes have to find a way to bring them in. So I don't do philosophy anymore as a professional work, but I sometimes read philosophical papers or I uh, listen to talks in philosophy and they inspire me and they bring back some ideas and, and thoughts that I have. I can't do it right now, but I'm still not entirely pushing it to the side. You do have to make choices during that middle phase of your career, graduate school, maybe first job, or which uh, company, which job you take, which role you take. And that's okay, as long as you realize that there will be a time at which you then can broaden again. If you are lucky like I am that you are in a department where multiple perspectives are being pursued and you are rewarded and students are rewarded for having not just one narrow methodology or theory pursued, that's great. But even if you don't have that, know that later on, you know, our life expectancy is past 80. Your life expectancy is probably past 90. You will have so much time to come back to some of your early interests and develop new interests. So you don't have to be worried so much that you want to do everything at the same time and, and all with same intensity. You can order it a little bit and you just keep in mind that there will be time and there will be opportunities. That's, I think, the most important part that you see it really in a long time frame and not right now, I can't do the seven other things I love to do. It's okay, just think about the next few years and you'll do probably half of those at some point. And that's, I think, important uh, as a general rule, even for like tasks, like every day I have too many tasks. My to-do list is hopelessly long and I know I'm not gonna finish it, right? So I'll just start somewhere and then maybe jump ahead because I wanna do one of these things that uh, they're like fifth, sixth place down, but I really am motivated to do that. You just realize that it's a time extended project and life is a time extended project too. Thank you very much. Uh, with the time constraints, we have around 15 minutes before eight and I, do, I don't really want to overrun this too much. So perhaps the next question is going to go by a little faster. Um, but with that, that's, we have arrived to some attendees questions uh, that we've collected from our registration forms and to the attendees. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the chat right now. Um, how, one attendee asks, how does psychology relate to philosophy and STEM, which seems to be two quite different fields? Yeah, so you have to realize historically, everything was philosophy at the beginning. The pre-Socratics and uh, the you know, the so-called scientists were really natural philosophers all the way into the 16th, 17th century when the sciences began to be separate from philosophy. So they're like the children that went off and then physics and chemistry and then later on biology and uh, sociology and psychology, they all became their own disciplinary fields. And philosophy became somewhat more of a theoretical, conceptual, and maybe broader integrative endeavor. And psychology, because it's fundamentally about the human mind and human behavior, still has many of those inspirations from philosophy while also taking on quite seriously the methods of other STEM fields. And to me, it bridges because it takes seriously some of the questions that philosophers asked a thousand or 2000 years ago about morality, intentionality, about the self, and explores them with scientific methods. So in a sense, psychology is one, not the only one, but one important bridge between fundamental deep philosophical questions that many humans have. And this tool set that humans have developed in the last few hundred years of 
empirical experimental science and engineering and trying to answer some of those old deep questions and that's but also you know it's exciting for me that psychology connects these approaches i think that's a very good time to ask one of the attendees questions um john asks what's the most fascinating philosophical concept that you've explored answers to experimentally ah that's difficult um i would say i'm going to do cheating and say two things the first one was self-awareness or self-consciousness or self-concept. This is something that philosophers have discussed for a long time and have doubted. There is no self. Uh, it's an illusion, like Hume and others said. But when I started to empirically test what it means that people use language to refer to themselves or explore through introspection what's inside of themselves, or to reveal how they think about their own personality, who they are, who they're becoming, then I realized that it's actually not that important whether that is a thing inside of you that's a self. It's probably not. But the fact that we have the ability to think about something like that, think about ourselves in language, communicate about it, and build sort of memory structures, that to me was just really a great transition from a deep question that maybe we couldn't quite answer entirely, but really raise a number of new questions and could answer them. And the other one that clearly interested me was intentionality. So philosophers had for a long time asked, what is unique about human behavior? It's different from a stone rolling down the, uh, uh, the hill or a leaf growing and then turning red in the fall. And maybe different from animals, like dogs barking or jumping at their owner's lap. We don't know. But the fundamental distinction really was intentional behavior is something that requires a mind that looks ahead, that plans, that anticipates what might happen. And then we have our limbs and, and we have physicality, and so do robots, by the way. And we can then implement these ideas in the reality that we live in. And then the mind checks back and says, okay, what just happened? And updates its plans. And that intentionality is fundamentally the way in which we control our own physicality in the world, but thereby also control the world, influence the world and respond to it. And then we did some additional empirical research on how people really think about the details of what goes into an intentional action beliefs, desires, intentions, skill, don't have to go into the details. But it was this, again, deep question that we probably didn't fully answer, but parts of it we were able to answer. And that's also something that we constantly have to figure out with each other. Did, did you not invite me to this birthday party intentionally or unintentionally? It's gonna make a difference. Whether it was just an accident, you misspelled my email, or you actually really left me off because you didn't want me to be there. So that's real life, right? This philosophical concept, in a sense, influences what we do uh, every day. Another attendee asks, when studying moral psychology, which you did talk about earlier in this webinar, how often is the concept of life discussed? I'm sure it's probably another concept that, again, it cannot be fully um, explained, but right. what... How would you answer this question? Yeah, you know, at least in the scientific study of morality, the concept of life doesn't show up very often. It's more of a specific content that would be debated in ethical uh, domains, you know, obviously in the pro-life uh, versus uh, uh, abortion debates and uh, all the ideological and other arguments that people then make. It's really, in psychology, not very important, and in moral psychology, not very important. Not because the concept itself is not important, it's probably because it is so broad and so uh, all encompassing that we don't even focus our questions on it. It seems like moral psychology can only be about things that are alive and that have moral thoughts and moral judgments, but 
the questions of life and how we will protect it and how we damage it, those are ethical questions. So there's a difference between moral psychology as a scientific discipline and deep ethical debates or questions or conflicts. And I think life is more in the latter and not so much in moral psychology as a science. Mm, all right. Uh, Amleta Attendees asks, what do you think of human-robot interaction? Which did, which you mentioned that you've been uh, studying in the past few years. And kind of how can students get involved with issues relating to the, the philosophy, the philosophy philosophy, ethics, and of this technology? Yeah, so robots are, as I said earlier, not that good yet, but they're getting better. And so my position is that we should really think deeply about understanding how humans respond to robot and will respond to the robots of the future. We should think about the possible threats and dangers. We should also think about the enormous opportunities and we should involve the public, not just the science and engineering folks, but you know, as everyday people, we will face robots and many of our family members and friends will face robots, even if they are not scientists. So we need to think about what kinds of robots do we want to have in our lives? What do we want them to do? How many skills and what kinds of skills do we want them to have? And as a psychological researcher, I try to find out what those expectations are that people have, how they might change as people interact with robots, and what fundamental assumptions people make about robots, in part because we have evolved certain assumptions about other human beings and about animals. We haven't evolved with robots. But when you now put a robot in front of me that looks a little bit like an animal, a little bit like a human, I will have these fundamental responses that have evolved in my mind and I've practiced in my life for animals and humans. And so I'm probably gonna apply them to robots as well. I don't have a unique robot conception. And you know, the term life comes in here. That's an interesting one. It seems alive to me. I cannot help but think there's something in there, a mind, a character, an agent, so I'm very interested in these questions to learn more about how humans approach robots and will approach robots in the future and how much responsibility there really is on engineers and designers to build robots that are appropriate for humans, that bring the best out of humans and that adapt to humans and not force humans to adapt to them. All right, thank you for the answer. And uh, I. I believe this is the last attendee question from the registry, from the registration forms, but uh, this, this attendee want, most probably wants to have some research experience with a college professor. So how can students ask professors with no prior lab experience whether they can join them on their research? Yeah, so it's probably a little different if we answer the question for high school students versus college students. High school students, that's, that's difficult uh, because as a college professor, I already get a number of inquiries from college students. So typically I can't uh, bring a high school student into a lab. That's just, that would be too many people. But let's say either there, there's a high school uh, that has connections to a college or we'll talk about college students. In either case, just send an email you will not get responses from everybody. You will probably get uh, no answers from many people, but just try it. Now learn a little bit about what that person is doing, what the lab is doing. Uh, maybe talk to somebody who is already working there, another student. So inform yourself to make sure that this really is the right place. But from then on, you just have to try it. And uh, you can't, again, as I said earlier, you can't wait for being asked. That's probably not going to happen. If you take a course with a professor, then you make yourself known and you already have a good basis. So that's a good step up. And if there is an opportunity, for example, to work with a program, so there are some high schools that have programs of collaboration with colleges. But for example, small teams of high school students can work in the summer uh, or during some part of the year with some PhD students, then that would be a really good opportunity too. So look around what's there, wherever you live and be 
be bold because the worst thing that can happen is that you'll won't get an answer by email or the answer is no but you can just ask a lot of people who do the kind of work that you're interested in and one of them will probably say yes at some point thank you and uh we've moved on to the live q a session i see quite a number of questions in the chat so we're going to go over them first um, I just had a quick question. So I've actually conducted some research in cognitive science in high school. So I was really interested in your work particularly. And I saw in your research profile that you regularly, you regularly utilize methodologies such as, you know, reaction times, eye tracking. And a lot of the paper that I wrote, a lot of, because um, I did mainly a literature review, a lot of the research papers that I was, you know, observing and conducting research on, they incorporated the type, these types of methods. And can you elaborate where, particularly regarding on like what information that eye tracking and particularly provides in your projects and what kind of research projects you have used it for? Mm -hmm. So both reaction times and eye tracking are methods to get at cognitive responses that are a little faster than our conscious planning uh, controls. So for example, eye tracking is a very good method to find out what captures your interest. So eye tracking is typically in what direction do the eyes move uh, to the left or to the right. If there's some photo showing up on one side and on the other side, which one do I look at first? And also how long do I linger with my gaze? So eye tracking reveals attention, interest, further processing of that stimulus. It also reveals expectations. So if I hear you say a word, and there are multiple objects in front of the screen, then as soon as you say the word, my eyes will search for the object to which your word refers. So if you start a word with the first few sounds, my brain will already direct my eye gaze to a possible candidate of what you say, which is incredible because these things happen so fast that we just see the results of them. We can't plan them fully. So eye tracking in particular is great to reveal assumptions, expectations, attention, interest, but it's only one of the methods that we can use. Then you might ask people afterwards, so how do you feel about this? Or are you willing to pay $5 to look at this a little longer? Or, you know, there are many other ways in which we can then gather what is going on in the mind of the person. But reaction times and eye tracking allow you to get at that first and quick and initial and maybe more spontaneous response that sometimes is really what researchers are particularly interested in. Okay, definitely. Thank you so much for your answer. Uh, I know we just hit the 8, 8 p.m. mark, but there's another quick question. I believe it's a yes or no question. Um, does the nature of consciousness ever enter your pursuits of your research? Well, not my empirical research, but obviously consciousness is a fascinating topic. And, and really in answer to Molly's question, I did refer to it, right? It's the idea that eye tracking captures responses that are not conscious. Now, once my eyes rest on one picture or the other, I'm consciously processing that picture. But I didn't normally at least, consciously form an intention. Oh, okay, in 400 milliseconds, I will move my eyes to the right or to the left. Now, if you tell me once this red light comes on, you decide whether you're gonna look left or right. I can do that, then it's a conscious decision. But there are ways in which an experiment can get at processes that are not conscious. And that's where obviously as scientists, we do encounter the concept of consciousness. But it's not something that I study as its own phenomenon. We do also have one question that I can probably answer quickly about what it means to be a good community member. So at, at the risk that it sounds like I'm an ethical relativist, which maybe I am, what it means to me to be a good community member is to figure out what the community is that you are in and to contribute to that community's well-being. That community can be sometimes just your friend and you. It could be your uh, study team. It could be your school. It could be your country. It could be humanity as a whole. At any different time, we might see one or the other community. 
And what it means to be a good community member is trying to figure out what is good for the community, which sometimes is most of them, sometimes all of them, sometimes those who need it the most. So there's no one answer that's always exactly the same, but it's something that humans are fundamentally capable of to think about others' benefits and others' interests and others' value. And to be a good community member is exactly trying to do your best to do that. And sometimes we go wrong, right? If you are in the wrong community, you may be a good community member for that community, but you might actually damage other communities. That's unfortunately true for humans too. When we do benefit one community, we sometimes harm others. You have to be aware of that. That's, there's no escaping that. This is part of what we have evolved to be. And on that note and time constraints, I think we can approach the end of the webinar. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Malay, for spending this hour for me, the hour with us tonight. Uh, we're so happy that you invited, you, you, you accepted our invitation and we enjoyed this webinar so much. To the attendees, here are some social media accounts of Scienceholic. Uh, this is our email address and our Instagram and WeChat accounts which in which we are the most uh, active on and the link to our website has one that shows that we're currently accepting donations so if you're interested if you're willing to help us uh, fuel our future seasonal magazine editions you could head over to our websites to help us but again thank you so much to everyone to joining and attending this webinar and we hope you have a great rest of your evening yes, thank you Dr. thanks Norway. for having me bye bye everybody Thank you everyone. Thank, Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.